to Unified Conferencing. Just need any 
anything. I'll kill him. Get his clothes from Nitro. I will outplay like anything. It's just a for metal. You can search for the Nitro. That's not anything. You're not going to find that. Just search for the metal. You need some caffeine? No. We have water in there? Are you guys caffeinated? Okay. So it's uh, Tucker and Jess's show today, right? Why you, why you, that's your, that you guys are the diazine team, right? Okay. An over-enthusiastic yeah, bunch. Lecture 12, we're going to cover the diazines and uh, even the tri and tetrazines briefly, but the main, I think of, of all the heterocycles we'll cover today, probably the pyrimidines are the ones you're going to see the most, uh, followed shortly after that by the pyrazines and then finally the pyridazines. But these three heterocycles are extremely popular. And um, you see them as much as you'll see pyridines. Patrick, are you guys making any of the things in the yellow up there? Yes. Yeah. They're making them right now. In fact, we'll see one later from Patrick. Right. Uh, so this stuff is highly relevant, unlike yesterday's lecture, which was sleepy time because who makes pyrons? But uh, these are really important. So let's start with the general ways people make them. There, there, there are several uh, ways, but this summarizes roughly 75% of the things you're going to see out there. And um, for pyrazines, which we'll start with, you've got basically a 3 plus 3 approach. And I'm not talking about electron count. Don't think about cycloaddition. I'm talking about atoms. Okay, so the 3 plus 3 approach is basically to take the, an alpha amino ketone and try to dimerize it. And this Just can come in many forms. So I draw alpha amino ketone here, but it could be alpha halo ketone. An amine donor is also equivalent to that. Same thing, you can take a, a diamine and a uh, diketone and uh, put those together, and the oxidation state of the galaxyl doesn't have to be that. So, in fact, you could take the ditosylate and heat it up with air. It would also give you the pyrazine, because pyrazines love to form. So don't worry so much about the oxidation state of these components when you put them together. Now, in the, I think the, we'll only cover two natural products today. Yeah, just two. And this is one of them. It's a pretty important one. But before we get to all that, we should probably finish up what we started yesterday. At the end of the class yesterday, we talked about building block B, which is part of this interesting uh, medicine called pedoxosin. And we left-hand part of that molecule, you'll recall we made it through a uh, dipolar cycle addition onto a chromone. But um, we have to deal with this pyrazine thiophene tidbit. So the first part we need to delete is that isocyanate. And the isocyanate, of course, can be made from the corresponding amine. So let's just uh, clear that up. You can convert an amine into an isocyanate just by treating with phosgene or an equivalent thereof. And that gives us something which uh, should be more pleasing for you to look at. Now, when we see this heterocycle, we can, of course, disconnect it in one of two ways. We can look at it as a, a fusion of a 
pyrazine onto a thiophene, or we can look at it as a thiophene onto a pyrazine. <clears throat> so, uh, who was on the thiophene team? No one even wants to admit they were on that team. Uh, oh, Sarah, you were on the uh, thiophene team? Okay. Tell us about the thiophene. Let, let, let's imagine we make a, a thiophene annulate onto that a pyrazine. Does that look good to you? Um. Like if you needed to make a tetrasubstituted thiophene, because what would be required would be this, and then annulate on some sort of dicarbonyl. Yeah. Is that a molecule you want to make personally? No. Why not? Pretty electron rich, tons of amines. I don't know how to get any selectivity. It's going to be an absolute disaster. So, right away, we don't even need to draw it. The first thing we can do is say, okay, we're going to disconnect B and we're going to have A. Now, I need a good disconnection from the thiophene team, Sarah. Uh, what would be a good uh, building block to put this together based upon a known thiophene synthesis? Wonderful, perfect. And then the, uh, two carbons. The pi bond. Yeah. Perfect. So it's a gawald. Yeah. Anytime we see a carbon like that with an NH2 attached, remember that's a signaling element for nitrile. Okay, now this thing is going to derive itself from the amino compound via a Sandmeyer. And uh, we can use the same logic again, but the twist here is that we're going to take advantage of what's known as the Taylor pyrazine synthesis. And the logic of this will become clear in just a moment. And then when we disconnect this using the exact same thing we just learned up above, and recalling that carbons with an NH2 on them often can be traced back to a nitrile, we end up with uh, simple starting materials. So why do you suspect they go for the oxine? Zhang, any thoughts? Why would you make the oxine to do this? Why not just use the di dicarbonyl? Um, it's more stable. Well, number okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Yeah, it's one number one, more stable. What else? Tanner wants to say something. What? Regis selectivity is preordained. Exactly. You know this is going to be the more electrophilic site, and so that amine is going to go there, rather than if this was an aldehyde, you would have to switch it over. Get the opposite regiochemistry. Perfect. So Zhang is right. These are stable. Tanner is right. This ensures a regis selectivity. Then you just simply reduce that, Sandmeyer, and this is known as the Taylor pyrazine system. Synthesis. There are a lot of, of these, but this is sort of um, falls into the same category you see up there. So rather than recite to you the 100,000 pyrazine synthesis that exists out there, name reactions, you, you could predict it from the general outline above. Questions? So that finishes lecture 11. Okay, let's get back to 12. 
So the first natural product of the two we'll talk about today is, I think, you know, it's a flagship for pyrazine. If you take a look at the front page of your handout, I, I've spared you the drama of writing out the entire structure. It's a beast. And if you look here, the key to remember is that the spinach on the left is not the same as the spinach on the right. And that means you need some way of retroselectively bringing these things together. You can't just have a homodimerization or you're not going to get the natural product. So you have to have two components that are programmed, pre-programmed to react only with each other and not with themselves. So we'll go through the Hefkoff, the Fuchs, and the Winterfeld uh, synthesis. The first one is from the Hefkoff group, and it just takes an alpha acetoxic ketone and intermediate A, which is a methoxine with an alpha amino group. And the two of those unify with a loss of water and give you an intermediate that looks like Imagine the way I've, I've drawn it, they're sort of tantalizingly close to simply doing something like that. Which, after loss of methanol, gives you the product. Now, you can draw other mechanisms. You say, hey, Phil, what about if it uh, eliminates the other way, or it uh, dehydrates completely, and then it does some sort of electrostatic closure? Perhaps, but this is one of those degenerate mechanisms. There's many ways using this logic to get to this product, and that's why Fuchs and Winterfeld pretty much followed Hethcock's lead here and designed slightly different monomers for the same type of union. So problem of the day number one requires that Vince help us uh, understand how intermediate A can be brought to bear with this alpha azido ketone to give the exact same product again. So you can either take the iPad or you can tell me what to do. It's your choice. I would think this is the same mechanism. Just oh, it's the same? Oh, okay. All right. First step. Now, what do I do? Um, so deprotonate at that same position that you had just a poly. And then, what are you going to want me to do? And then push electrons onto the always. And, and then, then that would be a larger ring than you want, and we can't easily do the SN2 on that. Um, at least that's not what they propose. <clears throat> can't hear you. Somebody speaking? Oh, the what is Elena saying? I can't hear you. Is the azide added to the anoxone? To the oxine? Is this what you want, Alina? Am I at the right oxidation state to get to a pyrazine? Yes, I am. Get rid of that. Get rid of that.
pyrazines want to form. So if you form the initial six-member ring, a lot of things will get you to home. Even air, if you don't have the right oxidation state built into the molecule. All right, along those lines, uh, this one ups the ante a little bit. So maybe Saul can help us with problem day number two. And I assume you won't want the iPad, you just want to tell me what to do. That's a weird one, isn't it? Because there's not really um, too obvious of a electrophile there. Like, I don't see the electrophile. Do you? No. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Hmm. So maybe the trick for this one will be do something first to make an electrophile. Take your time. And if anybody else has, then you can chime in. I mean, we can tomorize the enamine to make an enamine electrophile in that position. I don't know if that gets us anywhere. All right, there's your, I give you your taught American form back for don't just add in intermolecularly like that. This is a special one, the one that Elena solved. Um, it's intramolecular, but intermolecular, hmm, unlikely. And it's actually, it's far more likely that if this imine tautomer is around for as long as you desire it, I would just have that at it. Sure. And then your whole plan of getting a heterodimer is done. So the, the key of the ceph cephalostatin synthesis is having the pre-programmed monomers that do not react with themselves under any circumstances. Does enamine nitrogen add into inside nitrogen first, electrophilic inside nitrogen? I don't think that gets us anywhere productive either. Mm -hmm. an bond, don't want an N bond, that's for sure. Is there a tautomer of a vinyl azide? Aha, a tautomer, you're getting close. Tautomer, but what would happen with a vinyl azide if you heated it up? Nitrine. What, what, what do you say next? Nitrine. Nitrine. All right, let's think about the nitrine for a moment. What does that do? What's another form of that thing? of a pseudo-aminium, but if, if it's easier for you to just draw it as that, and we add in here, this can then come back here, can't it? Yeah, it's the only time we will cover in this class a azurine. weird, doesn't it? Obviously, it's going to be fleeting, and we'll love to uh, couple. Can you help us? That's all. 
finish it? Uh, yeah, you just tell him to open the zero DNA. Like and all of our oxidation state is right. This one here is going to come into conjugation there to give you your purity. And we're done. Any questions? That sample is set. That is almost done with pyrazines before we get to the benzanulated ones. Uh, diketa by pyrazines are a great source of pyrazine. We, we've used this in our lab. Hundreds of people have used it. It's very, very useful. How do you make diketa by pyrazines? Uh, some of you, other than Sal, who have made uh, uh, peptides before, is there anybody here who knows how to make a DKP? Well, yeah, that sounds good. Peptide coupling sounds good. So what most people do is there are many ways of making DKP. Sometimes you can just take an amino acid and heat it up, and it will lose water and form a ketopapyrazine. Sometimes that happens inadvertently. If you want to make a control so that R is not equal to R, rather R prime, then you just start off with one of the amino acids. You do what Tucker said, peptide coupling, then deprotecting cyclides. If you take a DKP and you heat the thing up in PLCL3, we are now in pyrazine land. And you can imagine I can make some really wacky derivatives here. So I can take all, I can take, you know, there's a trillion billion amino acids that you can make or buy. You can make the DKP, you can PLCL3 it, and now you've got these two rather bizarre and exotic groups here, and you can then Suzuki or Buckwald your way to analog happiness. A lot of people do that. That summarizes, I don't know, 1,000 JMED chem papers. Questions? Okay, if you turn to the front page of your handout, uh, it's on here somewhere. You've got a varenicline. Here it is. You remember we covered uh, varenicline in a prior context. I think it was in the lecture where we covered pyridines. We covered the cytosine story, and I promised you we would see the smoking cessation drug known as Chentix that arose from those efforts at Pfizer. Remember the dueling Orglat papers where one person did a heck reaction, the other person did a Suzuki coupling and a hydrogenation. You remember that? Yeah. All of those efforts led to this billion dollar drug. And you'll notice the cytosine part is here. That's the inspiration right there. And we've got a pyrazine. And the way they made that pyrazine was through the diamine via careful dinitration followed by reduction and then mixing it with glyoxal. So that's the synthesis of varenicline. Quinoxalanes. If you want to call quinoxalanes, Benzopyrazines. I'm not going to make fun of you. They're quinoxalanes, but you can also call them that. It's fine. Um, sometimes quinoxalanes come in weird locations. So, for instance, this little heterocycle we see here, you could characterize it as a quinoxalane. You could characterize it as a maybe a pyrrol. You could say it's a pyridine with a fused pyrazine on it. I mean, you could call it a bunch of things. But for now, all I care what you do is tell me how to make it. So when you look at this molecule, do you have any insights as to where we should start? You could use aromaticity as a guide. Um, it's really up to you. Several ways to break this down, but really only one that's truly logical. Steve, any thoughts on there? Yeah, I'd cut the bond at the two position, the pyridine and the amide bond. Uh, no, other one.
that what you want? That's pretty good. Any other takers? There's other ways of doing this. equivalent is. And then feel free to crash close. Perfectly fine. But you just made a quadoxalin. You didn't realize it. You just made it. Uh, another very interesting reaction for making quadoxalin is that um, is actually quite humorous for a reason you'll see in a moment. It is called the Beirut reaction because that's where it was discovered. So they named it after the city. And the Beirut reaction takes advantage of an interesting little heterocycle that I think is not widely known because it's mostly in the journals of like heterocyclic chemistry or journal of heterocyclic chemistry, heterocycles. It's in weird journals, so you don't often see it. But BFO, benzofurazan oxide, very useful way of making uh, quin quinoxalane dianoxides. Uh, now, in order to rationalize the reactivity, when you take an enamine and you react it with BFO, it's been known for a long time, that's why it's a name reaction, uh, it reacts and you can rationalize the react reactivity of BFO by just thinking about it as its ring open form, a bis-nitroso compound. So this is just a tautomeric form of that. And so you take any enamine, and actually many nucleophiles will work, even diketones. Uh, you, you take this enamine and you react it with BFO, and that's the product you get. So it's pretty easy to rationalize this. So pretty simple, right? That's the Beirut reaction. <clears throat> so let's fast forward 30 years to this paper that came out in Nature last year. And uh, I need you now to, now that you know what the Beirut reaction is, tell us what the product is here. Well, I'll give you a second to think about it, and then I'll, I'll need to get someone's help for the step one. Step one, the clue is no BFO yet, just these two.
And uh, we can probably draw the tautomeric form, can't we? bring BFO in. <laughs> I gave you the mechanism up there. So can you imagine what the product is? This is an enamine, just like that one. product surprising to you based on the favorite reaction where I just showed you? Saul, are you startled by that result? Chang, startled? Well, now that you know the Beirut reaction, is there anything bizarre about it? Let me ask you this. Is this new reactivity? The title of this paper is Controlling an Organic Synthesis Robot with Machine Learning to Search for New Reactivity. I'll leave it there. Okay, so uh, the next topic, probably the most important heterocycle we'll cover today, is the pyrimidine. Pyrimidine is super duper important, and they are super fun to make. These are the funnest heterocycles, and you see them all the time. And you often have to make them. So, Patrick, have you made any pyrimidines yet? He's made them. So, remember, I asked pyridines. He's like, nope, never made a pyridine. But he has made pyrimidines. So, these are the ones on the spectrum that you actually have to make. You can't just buy everything. All right, let's summarize 10,000 papers in the next couple minutes. So, the most common way of making pyrimidines, the way that you're going to almost always think about them, is the 3 plus 3 approach, the Taube, so-called Traube route. And the Traube route involves taking a dicarbonyl and some sort of amidine or guanidine type of compound. And you just put them together. Lose two molecules of water, and out pops your primidine. So there's are the rules of engagement. R1, 2, 3, 4, what they can be. You can tolerate a huge variety of substituents. And for example, if R3, this one, were to be an ester, you'll get out the primidinone. If, for example, R3 was a nitrile, you would do what we've been teaching over and over and over again, which is that you get an amino pyrimidine, because that carbon there is your nitrile. And finally, if R4, let's say this were just urea, out pops a different isomer of a pyrimidine out. That's the trial bay, most useful way of making pyrimidines. Five plus one, we learned at the end of class yesterday, do you remember? Fidoxosin, we took the amine that uh, Hannah made with dipolar cycle addition, and we take the pyrazine isocyanate that the Taylor pyrazine synthesis was used to make, bump them together, and the 5 plus 1 approach, where the 1 is the amine and the 5 is this <coughs> component here, and you'll get out that. And then the Viginelli. Does the Viginelli remind you of an as a variant of a reaction we already learned? Hanch, thanks, Cheng. It's just a Hanch reaction. Remember the Hanch purity, dihydropyridine synthesis? 
so the hand, dihydropyridine synthesis would be this with the olefin here. So it would just be two of these and one of the aldehyde. Remember that? With, a, with, a, with a ammonia? Vigenelli is the same thing, but it's the, as a version of it. And people have rendered these asymmetric as well. So if you want to control this chiral center, uh, do a Google Scholar search and you'll find a thousand hits for that. And uh, Gigi has kindly uh, volunteered as we live stream the class to Dale's office uh, to teach us how we make these pyrimidines through cycloaddition. that reacts of this amidine is that. Silly question, Gigi, how do you make amidines? Um, uh, you can use just treat, just treat, the, treat the nitro with the ammonium. Yep. The hydrochloride. Perfect. We'll need that. Remember that. There, there's a lot of things you can do with nitriles, and you're going to need those things. So you can add to a nitrile. If it doesn't react well, you can first turn it into an imminoyl chloride. So you can take a nitrile, treat with dry HCl, and convert to an imminoyl chloride. You can then add ammonia. It'll give you the amidine. If it's reactive enough, you can take the nitrile by itself, add ammonia. It'll give you the amidine. You can add hydroxylamine to give you an amidoxine. You can add hydrozone to give you an amidrozone. Those components are really useful for making heterocycles. And we will see them again in a further in a future lecture. Great. Let's take a look at some two miscellaneous methods before we get into the all-important case studies. The first one is problem of the day number three, which perhaps, uh, as the president of the Diazine Club, perhaps Jess can help us out. Well, you can take the iPad if you want, or you can tell me what to do. I'll, I'll leave it up to you, because some people don't like the iPad. We, we got complaints from the president. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Pete called me to his office and said, stop harassing the students with that old iPad. So why don't you buy us a new iPad? Can't afford it right now. <laughs> what do you say, Jeff? Um, so first it forms um, the ketone and the... And hydride forms the mixed hydride, while the the nitrogen on the the nitrogen on the acetonitrile attacks the carbon. Is that what you just said? Yeah. Okay. And now what do I do? <clears throat> and then another uh, as a nitrile, um, the nitrogen attacks the carbon. For the yeah. All right. <clears throat> one that is quite weird and um, I thought would be 
pretty useless reaction, but actually turned out to be pretty useful. Actually, there's a company out there scaling this reaction up to make a fragrance of all things. Anyway, it was published in this uh, journal, Heterocycles, in 2006. <clears throat> the lead author is someone you may know. But uh, we need some help. We need a Shenviite to help us with this one. Start with the condensation. That phrase can be used quite often in heterocycles. Okay. Okay, great. We're done with all the random methods of making pyrimidines that we want to cover today. The canonical ones that are the most useful ones. And you are now mentally armed to tackle all of the case studies that we have to cover on pyrimidines, of which we'll cover uh, about four or five. And you'll see pyrimidines a lot for the rest of your life. So you'll appreciate these case studies. So for our first one, let's go to the front page of the handout. LY231514, where is it? There it is, right here. So I've just uh, abbreviated it. As AR, instead of showing that entire AR there. And we have a choice, we can do A or B. Which one are we gonna disconnect? Perhaps the Floridians wanna help us with this one. Uh, any thoughts on which one to disconnect? I have two arrows there, so you pretty much no wrong answer. But which one do you want to do? Um, I want to disconnect A. <clears throat> Leaving us with a pyrrole in its wake. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. And what do you want to couple that to? You're, you're clearly using a 3 plus 3 disconnection, right, Alex? Yes. So all we have to do to reconstitute what you said okay. is draw out. Yeah. That would do it, yes? Yeah, that, that would work. Why is that thiomethyl? Thiomethyl. You need some leaving group because, uh, you know, you need this amine to add into something. 
and the amine that's here and here are here and here. Good. How about the other way? Well, if we disconnect the other way, let's just... We have to think, of course, of how are we going to put that... How are we going to put that pyrrole on there? Any suggestions for how we might annulate that pyrrole on there? We would need something like this. And we need some component that represents that. Is there a name reaction we can do? Steve, do you know? Uh, I forget the name, but you just use an alpha chloro or alpha halocarbonyl. So we could bichler it to uh, happiness just by taking that aldehyde, either bromo or chloro, whatever you like, tosyl, whatever. <coughs> Coupling those together. Is there a potential issue with the coupling of this and this? I have uh, one, two, three, four nitrogens that could potentially do some attacking here. Is the an acyl? <clears throat> can you disconnect the CC double bond with B? Can you deprotonate? Uh, say that again, Tanner. You disconnect the CC double bond of B. Uh, uh, oh, of here? Yeah. Well, you won't need to do that. The Bischler will allow you if we get the if we can get the reach of selectivity right. This will form the imine, and then you'll get the, the, then the imine amine will add in, and the standard Bischler you can close it. The problem that we need to address here is we have all these nitrogens. Why is this going to be the one that could react? We need to go back to lecture number one for this one. Lucas, you want to give us your thoughts on the, that, uh, this pyrimidine puzzle? Why does the amine on the right, why would it be more reactive? Or maybe it's not. That, this might be the end of this disconnection. I wanted to go that way, but I'm not sure why. Okay, we're fine with that answer. So tell me this, Lucas. Uh, what kind of nitrogen is this? Pyridine. It's a pyridine nitrogen. And... Um, so this amine here is kind of, if we just stare at this, this amine here looks like what kind of, like two amino purity, right? Okay, now let's look at this one. What kind of nitrogen is this when I look at it from this bond? Pyrrole-like. So this is like, kind of like almost like an, an amino pyrrole. So it's splitting hairs because you could mention, well, this is a vanilla system, but based on that rough analysis, you would say, this one is kind of like a two amino pyridine. It's got this other one here, which you can draw in its tautomeric form, so it's like guanidine. Uh, so it shouldn't be very nucleophilic, because it's tied up in this area. Whereas this one is more analinic-like, and so it should be more of the nucleophilic one that engages in imine bond formation. And that's why you get that selectivity. So not all amines are created equal. That diamino compound is good to go. And uh, we need a way of making this. And you can just look at over here. This is super simple. Done. Chang's favorite reagent. Guanidine plus cyanoacetate. What do you say, Steve? Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So when we think about like pyridine-like nitrogens, yeah. a lot of times they behave as nucleophiles, right? Mm, that's true. So why well, it depends where it is in the pyridine. So if it was a C2 pyridine, very different from a C3 pyridine. Help here. So when you do a buckwall coupling, for example, the ligand you use for this one is more like a xanthos type. 
because it's a mite like. Whereas the ligand used for this one is more of a standard phosphine. Is that right? Because this is like an amide. Is that, I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's, oh, that's like, it explains the DMAP thing too. I was thinking about right? Same idea. Same for C4. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we, we still have Alex's disconnection over in Florida. And it's not, uh, you know, I don't think it's bad to make this disconnection. And you certainly could come up with a, a pyrrole synthesis that would, that would get you there eventually. But I guess the question for all of you is, if you do this exercise and you break up A and B, Alex, are you still favoring the pyrrole? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't really want to make that pyrrole. Yeah, I don't want to make that pyrrole. And from a diversity standpoint, probably you're going to want to do a lot of just uh, modifications of this portion here. There's not much to change here. Right, so this approach allows you to take the diamino pyrimidine node and couple it with an array of halide, of electrophiles and get you the product, whereas that pyrrole needs to be made special every time. And it's probably going to be at least three steps to make, whereas this, by the way, is commercial, but if you couldn't make it, you could make it easily. And um, those you'll have to make. It's not fairly straightforward. So this exercise of doing the A and B saved you a lot of time because you don't need to go to SciFinder until you have... I mean, I, don't, I think if you were to do this in the real world, the only thing you'd be SciFindering is how do I prepare these really quick? You wouldn't need to SciFinder that. But this one, you still need to SciFinder this pyrrole probably, come up with a bunch of disconnections for that one, and it's a little hairier. Questions? Okay, great. How about this next one? U101033. There is no wrong answer. So Max? Where's Max 2? We lost Max 2. All right, Max 1. Um, I feel like um, the uh, parole use has come from treatment of the corresponding ketone of PCL3 and not like just to see a confirmation that way. Well, before you give us all that, that that's going to be useful in a minute. Just oh, tell us. Oh, which ring? Um, yeah, which ring do you want to open? Do we want to look at this as being a, um, a, some sort of amino pyrimidine? Or do you want to look at it as being some sort of uh, hydrogenated indole that we build on? Um, and primitive on to. Um, let's just break up A, I guess. So. That? And the donor for that thing is going to be pretty much the same, except you probably would want to use this. Mm, probably wouldn't want to do that either, because we don't know which one is going to leave. So you're probably going to have to use the exact same building block that we used for Alex. Maybe this one. And that would give you the product with S methyl here, and it would give you OH there. You would then add in your PLCL3, you would add in stepwise. Okay? Now we gotta make that thing. Oh, you could probably disconnect the uh, pen uh, base and uh, carbon one. So just between like the amine and the uh, nitrogen. Here? Yeah. no wrong answer. We just have to evaluate which one do you want to go to the hood and do. 
So if we go the other way, we've got that, and we can use Steve's disconnection again. And where do you suspect this thing will come from? 246. Oh, yes. 246. We love 246. What are the rules of engagement for that one, Tanner? I'm going to add in the mean, and which one does it go first? It's going to go, six, I guess, 6 is one. Yeah, that one. Then? Here? Yeah. So this can be two, and this can be three. Yeah. Are you happy with that? No, you don't like it. Where do you want the order to be? I agree with one, but I think That is correct. So this is the third one. This is the second one. Normally that's the, the order for SNAR. <coughs> And so, super nice because you can add prolidine, prolidine, NHR, which is this piece here, and then add in the alpha bromocyclohexanone, which you can buy, and you get the product. If you're in MedChem, which route do you prefer? Bottom one, clearly. But who knows? Maybe process chemists might want this one. But being able to put both of those disconnections with lightning speed, that's uh, quite some value. I mean, you pretty much instantaneously will get that job. I guarantee you. If they put that on the board and you show them this, their teeth will fall out. Six-figure job just because you put this on the board. It's pretty good. All right, let's look at the next one. CGP 59326. This is a good one. So in one sense, you could say to me, hey, Phil, why don't we just do what we've been doing the whole time? if we took a pyrimidine and we built up a pyrrole. What's the potential stumbling block of this approach? Gigi, what do you not like about that? Yeah, regional selectivity is going to be a problem. Definitely could be an issue. So let's take a look at the other way. This can be also, if we want, it can be that. Probably better to show it as that. How would we make that? Could we use the same logic we saw over there? Yes.
That looks pretty good, doesn't it? This was done on process scale. And the key problem was not making the pyro. It was actually making that alpha amino ketone and having the thing be stable to sit around. That alpha amino ketone was made using a name reaction from alanine. It's a reaction worth knowing just because its mechanism involves a heterocyclic intermediate. So there's alanine. And if you take it with acetic anhydride, triethylamine, and heat, out pops that with an NHAC. So the first step of the Dakin-West reaction is obviously just going to be acetylation. And because we have a lot of acetic anhydride floating around there, we're going to get mixed anhydride. And that will then cyclize to this nifty little heterocycle. Oxazolone. And the oxazolone is super duper acidic. That oxazolone will form the corresponding anion if you look at it in a mean way. And it turns out there's a really good electrophile just floating around. Acetic anhydride. And after loss of CO2, you get out the product, where the product is equal to the acetylated species. So the intermediate, you can imagine, used to have CO2 there. So they do this on metric ton scale, the Dakin-West reaction, to get out this acetamide, which they then treat with sodium hydroxide. They use that alpha amino ketone without any isolation at all, immediately dump it into malonyl and out pops that amino pyrrole. Now we have an amino pyrrole, folks, and we are ready for the key step, because we somehow need to put that NHAR, and there's no more palladium available. How should we rearrange that? Uh, dim Roth. Dim Roth. So if you heat this thing up in ethylene glycol, it undergoes what is known as a Dim Roth rearrangement. And the Dim Roth rearrangement is a really important one to remember. You'll see this a lot. In MedChem, often you'll see it as a byproduct that you didn't want. In process, as in this case, you use it as something that you do want. And it basically equilibrates through a ring opening, ring closing. So when you heat this thing up, you can imagine the nucleophile, it can be water, it can be ethylene glycol, opens this thing up. The bond here then rotates, and it's a thermodynamically driven process so that what closes up at the end of the day is your product. No palladium here, folks. Questions? That was done on huge scale. 
Okay, no question. Oh, what do you say, Matt? So we'd get a substitution at the end of nitrogen. Then you'd be in a bit of hurt. So, so, so if substitution here? Yeah. Then it would all depend on relative PKAs and, and okay, you know, so sterics and... So it's all like empirical. It's, it's empirical. all empirical. Yeah. It's all luck of the draw. Well, when you have a free NH and then an AR, yeah, then you're going to favor the isomerized product. We may see more bizarre examples of Dimroth in a later lecture. And if you were at our group meeting last weekend, you saw one as well. What do you say there, Pablo? So, I would always say there is no nuclear power in Dimroth. There is no nuclear power in Dimroth. What is happening? Well, you're, you're refluxing an ethylene glycol, and I think there's also uh, water oh, okay. and ethanol. It's like a mix of solids. So, ethanol is a nuclear It can be water, it can be ethanol. You're, you're heating this thing up to 180 degrees. You don't like it, so it's okay? All right. Questions? Okay, good. How about fluorindole from BMS? The reason we cover this one really briefly is that there are 28 co-authors on it. So I, I think we pro probably need to cover it at least briefly. Uh, where is it? BMS fluoroindole. There it is. Aha. We're not going to cover the indole part. We did that in the previous lecture. We're just going to cover this part right here. So can someone very quickly just give me the starting material I need for that? some substituents, that would be good. easier to take this one, that aldehyde is rather unstable, it's much easier to take the malinate with the methoxy in the middle, condense, add, and then burn off the other chloro. I mean, you needed 28 authors in this paper, so there was some thought involved. <clears throat> Questions? Okay, how about PTX? Clearly, a couple of different destinations we can make, and uh, it's sort of up to you which way you want to go. We've got a pyridine, and we have it linked, or it could be a pyridine, but if you want to think of it as a quinoline, you could think of it as a quinoline, too. Uh, connected to a diamino pyrimidine. So which way do we go? Well, there may be some of you who are really happy from the midterm and just want to make a pyridine. So... Let's think about that. That would be the disconnection from the purity, correct? <clears throat> 
Dungman, you want to make that purity? I mean, if you can pass as well. I guess maybe it would be better to do the other way. Maybe. Let's see. looks like uh, Combs type that we just learned the other day, isn't it? So all I did was I took that diamino pyrimidine, and I'm just going to say, hey, is this a decent surrogate for aniline? Because if this was aniline, this is straight out of the quinoline note, isn't it? Is it a decent surrogate of aniline? Are you happy with it being aniline? You look us? This nitrogen is kind of invisible, as you, we learned just a minute ago, and these two are the same. So we don't care which one this one goes on. It's all good. Now, if we're in desert island mode, and all you have is some coconuts, and you need to make that, can you give me the microsecond speed answer? Tanner, how do we make it? Brilliant. <laughs> and then whatever dye am I? Yeah. Super. Questions? So before we get to pyrimidi uh, pyridazines, we've got to cover this second natural product of the day, and last one, called variolin B. This is a really cool one. So let's think about some disconnections. I'll give you a minute. We're doing reasonable on time. Any super creative disconnections you can see? Are there any sort of hidden symmetries that are hiding in there? Yeah, go ahead. Break the B ring. The bottom bond of it doesn't get the symmetrical compound. Aha! to an ester. You like that, Saul? That's probably the best way to make it. But there are other ways. So let's imagine we take a look at this and say, you know what? Let's do an immediate disconnection of the C ring. So if you fancy more of a stepwise approach, could also view it as arising from that. And then perhaps even a more easy disconnection would be the realization that we can use a Bilsmeyer approach. And that looks even better. Because now we see this and say, whoa, 
we can get rid of that. And the entire skeleton rapidly unravels. I'm going to get rid of that oxidation there. And now, look how close I am to just making an azaindole. So I can take this compound, I can DDQ it up to give the unsaturation there. I can Vilsmeyer my way to the side chain. I can dump in guanidine to make my pyrimidine. And then this just comes from the intramolecular addition of a carbodiimid. And that is derived from the corresponding amine, of course. And where this gets me to is... Finally, it's a much longer synthesis, but I think it has instructive purposes. And as an indole, which can easily be made through Hemmetsberger. <clears throat> How do you like that? Pretty fast, but not as fast as that. That's variolin. Okay, in the final 20 minutes, we need to cover just a few more heterocycles, and we don't need much time for these because they're relatively straightforward. The pyridazines are quite similar logically to pyroles thiophenes, furans, because you're only going to be looking for, in most cases, a 1, 2, 3, 4 dicarbonyl, which is coupled with hydrazine to give you the product. The 2 plus 2 approach is more of a stepwise one, where you would do a, some sort of aldol followed by then adding in hydrazine. But in almost all cases, when you make pyridazines or their benzannulated uh, uh, versions, either the thalazines or the cinnolines, they are going to be made from diazo intermediates that can be derived from the corresponding aniline. For example, the famous von Richter cinnolin synthesis, which can start from either the methyl ketone or the acetylene, simply by taking these anilines that are derived from palladium couplings or frito crafts rearrangement or reactions with sodium nitrate to give you the diazo intermediate, and then that cyclizes to your cinnolin. Okay, so let's take a look at some strobularin analogs uh, that uh, are part of a program that led to a billion dollar um, agrochemical agent. It was an insecticide, uh, the DuPont cells. Really successful agrochemical. So this first one is an interesting one because it uses a starting material a lot of people forget exists. compound there is called uh, mucobromic acid. And it's actually widely available. And you just take phenylhydrazine and you couple in mucobromic acid. And you see here there's a latent aldehyde. So the phenylhydrazine, uh, the nitrogen here, attacks at that aldehyde position when in the ring open form, followed by cyclization. And you get that. And then these two bromides are electronically differentiated. One of them you can add methoxide. The other one is ready for Suzuki couplings. Can't do Michael into this, but you surely can do Michael into that. So treat that with methoxide. Cleanly get out that. Problem of the day number four is the second compound in this sort of DuPont program. Uh, another very interesting way to make um, a pyridazine type heterocycle. And uh, happily... Uh,
Chang has volunteered. So we'll give you a minute to think about B. Maybe we can hand him the iPad so he can start working on that. What do we say here, Cheng? Phenyl <laughs> hydrazine plus that thing. Just missing nitrogen and we're almost there. Okay. Now what do we do? Just do you have to add to the unstyled? Well, I don't know how to do that. Is it, what is this over here? Is that an arrow? Please. <laughs> because if it's an arrow, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pet drawing. <laughs> oh, okay. You could have said it's an arrow. Let it be an arrow. Seals Alder. That looks good. Yeah. Happy with that? Great. How about insecticide lead D, uh, C? The first disconnection that I think is really important to recognize here is that what they did is they excised these two completely. Look 
at that. Gone. How do you do that? While I'm drawing the, the uh, uh, starting material for this, tell me the logic of how you in the world you would disconnect that in that way. <coughs> Bless you. Because it seems kind of weird that you could do that. All right, you've had plenty of time to think. So, uh, Dungman, what are the conditions to go from there to there? Do I, I'm going to need to do some CH activation, all right. All right, so irid iridium with what ligand? Too. Sorry? Is aldol CH activation too then? Controversial question. Oh, no, please. <laughs> CH functionalization. Let's all just go to sleep now. Well, I'm sure you can find a formal aldol, but it's probably discovered by a robot. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, new reactivity. Uh, okay, yeah, so why don't we do aldol? So LDA and, and then LDA again. So, yeah, this is just a hiding ketone. Crouching ketone hidden nitrogen. It's the name of the movie. <clears throat> and uh, add your hydrazine in. That's how you get it. Okay, super. How do we make triazines, folks? Well, we got the 124, the 135, the 123. The 124 is um, pretty simple. You take your a precursor, which we are going to see, I think, tomorrow to make things like aminazoles. But if you take that precursor, and instead of cyclizing it to make an oxazole or adding in ammonia to make a amidazole, if you add in hydrazine, guess what? 1,2,4 triazine. The 1,3,5 is some t usually made by Aldrich or your commercial vendor via the trimerization of a nitrile, a strong acid. But in practice, most people, you'll find uh, maybe 1 million BMCL papers where they start from the 1,3,5 trichloro triazine and then add in nucleophiles one at a time. For example, on the front page of your handout is two compounds from AstraZeneca that are secretase compounds. If you look at those structures, analogs upon analogs have been made just by adding various things in. You can add almost anything you want, and yes, you can do palladium couplings, and you can do it stepwise. So it adds once and then stops. Um, this is like the favorite MedChem scaffold. In fact, when DNA encoded library synthesis was invented, I think one of the first things they did was they threw a triazine on DNA and added a bunch of nucleophiles one at a time. Okay. All right, great, and we're ready for Shishi again. Awesome, because this one is straight out of Boger's uh, lab. Uh, the way to make one, two, three, one, two, three triazine is pretty rare. They're not super stable. Uh, and the way that uh, Dale invented to make this starts from an aminopyrazole. The aminopyrazole is treated with sodium pyridate, and that gives rise to the 1, 2, 3 triazine. Any clues on how to make this thing? Adjust the camera. Pretty good. <clears throat> Tetrazines. You know, the reason we're flying through these is it's diminishing how much you actually see these things in MedChem as you get to... And when you get the tetrazines, basically, unless you're going to start working for the army after you leave Scripps, making explosives, you're not going to make a lot of tetrazines. You can't buy many of them. You can buy a couple, but they're, you know, they're, they're pretty shock-sensitive in many cases. 
Um, so often people will uh, make them, for instance, from the nitrile or the acid or ester via a hydrazine reaction followed by oxidation, and those often those condensations often go, not surprisingly, via that, which can then can be oxidized up. Or you can, yeah, usually by that, after tautomerization. So double attack, tautomerization, and then oxidation will get you to your full tetrazine. Only one example I could find of uh, a tetrazine that would be medicinally relevant. It's for, I think it's still used for some types of brain cancers. It's a pretty useful compound uh, called Temidar. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, this is a problem of the day number six. So methyl isocyanate plus this diazomidazole gets us to Temidar. Max? Uh, do you do uh, sort of an ablation on the uh, cyanate, and then how do you mean that formed after reacting the cyanate, just add back into the uh, isoc part? So see that your chalk is in the other position. Um, so it shows... Where my chalk is? What do you want me to do? Well, um, I was thinking of uh, rain nitrogen actually adds first. Or I guess you can push it from there and then on the way, yeah, sure. Yeah, all around, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and, yeah, I can sure. So it's still an operation. And then that, I mean, just adds back in to the, um, the anti bone. That is Temodar. Von Richter, this step. If you want a less dangerous approach, you can simply start off with this amino midazole, and uh, that will give you this. followed by NaNO2 to get the product. Perfect. Now, normally we would be done pretty much on time, but uh, Patrick has sent us this very nice uh, problem here, um, so we should go through it. So there's two ways of looking at this, and now all of you are armed with the, with the knowledge of how to make a compound like this, except for the fact that we haven't learned how to make pyrazoles. But let's imagine we need to make a pyridazine, or sorry, a pyrazine. If we make the pyrazine and close to a pyrazole, this is a disconnection, which is fundamentally flawed. This is a bad disconnection. Why? I don't know how to get reach of selective enamination of a, of a pyrazine. It's going to be stymied by the fact that you've got these two necessary leaving groups. And then further, making everything miserable is this sort of uh, acetic acid hanging off. So that disconnection looks pretty bad. But we did look, learn a disconnection back when we talked about uh, isoquinolins. I don't know if you all remember that. By the way, this is not known in SciFinder, but we don't need SciFinder. This is scripts. Okay. So if you do you folks remember this? Straight out of one of the lectures. Remember this? We all remember this, right? 
the dinitrile, you treat it with HBr, you get that. Then you can say in Meyer and put a chlorine there, for instance, or you can Suzuki first and do the, or you can, I don't know what you, what the X's mean are probably Buckwall, Hartwig, Suzuki, Ullman, Goldberg, Gamish. Anything you want. So this would be for, fine for you. And uh, this thing just comes back from So there's a couple options to make a pyrazole like that. We can try for region selective alkylation. Or you can append an equivalent onto that on your hydrazine and then uh, um, add it to this. And the TAs will send you a, then we went to SciFinder. Once we identify this, just to give you conditions to get that. So we have a nice way of making this for you. And with this in hand, this cyclization has got to work. And the other disconnection makes no sense. So you're not going to be able to go from here to there. So the only viable one is start with a P-Result, append on a, um, Pyrazine, although I would say append on an isoquinoline. Right? Steve? How do you control that cyclization? Well, just like we saw it already. We saw it already in the quinoline. This is a more reactive nitrile, so the HBR adds here, and then we saw it we saw the exact same thing in the quinoline lecture. Identical. Except that instead of being a pyrazole, it was an aromatic ring. Remember? Look back in your notes, you'll find the exact same thing. I think this is okay. If it's not, let us know. All right, we'll see you tomorrow, folks. Sorry for the extra five minutes.